Happy Father's Day. Fathers, you are the ones that make that weekend barbecue happen. You put together the super secret dry rub and mob recipe that satisfies every single person in the family. Now it's no secret that when our earthly fathers match the love of our heavenly father, the world is a much better place. And while not all of us will get to experience the love of an earthly father today, we all share in the love and the experience of our love from God the Father. First uh, John 3, 1 begins with this. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The Father's love for you gives you acceptance into the family. And so today, we worship together as a family, united in worshiping God the Father as children of God. morning, First Baptist family. Let's join our voices together to invite our loving Father's presence with us. Wherever you are, sing with us, Come Thou Fount, Come Thou King.
So in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, we read, Many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, encircled the throne and sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Let's join with those angels in singing, Worthy of Worship.
So pray with me now. Let's pray. Jesus, you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You are holy and spotless, blameless and pure. And yet you gave your life willingly so that we could be forgiven. It's for that reason that we worship you today. We bow humbly before you and say thank you. Worthy is your name, Jesus. We worship you today and we invite the Holy Spirit's presence to come among us. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
So how has the whole worshiping at home thing been going for you? Have you found that it's been a little bit awkward singing in your living room? I sure know I have. And I've also found out that when there are only four people in your home church and you are the worst singer out of those four, you really can't hide it. I've had more than a few funny looks from the kids these past few weeks when I'm singing my hymns. And I'll say this too while I'm at it. I guarantee you, I guarantee you that my worship experience at home is way weirder than yours is. I mean, think about it. You don't have to listen to yourself preach. It's weird. I don't even think I registered just how strange it was until a, a couple of Sundays ago when I was watching the service with my family. And after the TV version of me prayed, my daughter asked me if I had prayed along with the TV version of myself. It was kind of a mind-blowing moment for me, you know? I mean, that's stuff they don't teach you in seminary. It's all been kind of strange these past few months, to be honest. Uh, But I think in all the strangeness, there have been some bright spots too. For instance, it's been a nice reminder that we don't need a building to worship God. Even though we are all at home, we are still worshiping. I've told you before that I think one of our biggest mistakes that we make as Christians is thinking that the church is a building when in fact it's the people of God. Church family, one of my hopes for us during this time when the coronavirus has kept us away from our building, 
One of my hopes is that we would really understand this, that we are the church. And even when we are unable to meet together in our building, it doesn't prohibit us from being the church and doing what the church does. I bring this up today because we are starting a new series on worship. For the next few weeks, we're going to be taking a look at what Scripture has to teach us about worship. We'll take a look at what worship is and isn't, and we'll also see what kind of worship is pleasing to God. We won't touch on every aspect of worship or even close to it, but we will get to some of the big stuff. For today, I want to talk a little bit more about this idea of how our location affects our worship. It's a topic that Jesus himself addresses in John chapter 4 in a conversation he has with a Samaritan woman. But before we get there, though, let's lay a little groundwork. I think it would be helpful for us to consider what worship is for a moment. We use that word a lot, that worship word, but we don't often stop to consider what it means. So let's take a look at it and see if we can get a better understanding of what biblical worship is. Now, I don't think any of you at this point would be surprised to know that worship is not just about singing songs, even though it probably is the first thing that you think about when you hear the word worship. So what is worship if it's not just singing songs? Well, if you look at the original original biblical languages, you'll see that there are a lot of different words that we translate into that one English word, worship. And a quick look at these words reveals that worship can involve a lot of different things. It can involve service. It can involve bowing down or prostrating yourself. It can involve praise. It can involve devotion. So that's a lot more than just singing, right? It can be a little bit difficult to figure out how to make sense out of all this. So let me tell you what helps me when I consider what biblical worship is. I like to think of worship as being our appropriate response to God. Thinking about it like this helps us to keep our concept of worship God-centered. He is the object of our worship. But more than just being the object of our worship, He is also the cause of our worship. When we encounter the living God, we react to Him. Being in His presence affects us. His presence demands a response. And our response to Him is our worship. So in other words, we encounter God and we sing Him praises. We encounter God and we fall on our faces. We encounter God and we agree to serve Him. We respond to Him. You can't be in God's presence and be unaffected any more than you could stand in front of the Grand Canyon and not be in awe. This is what we see throughout the Scriptures when someone meets with God. There's always a strong reaction. Now understand that there is more to it than that, but that's enough to get us started for today. So let's get back to John chapter 4. I'm going to focus in on a portion of this passage, so let me give you the context for the rest of it. What happens in John chapter 4 is Jesus is traveling, and in his travels, he passes through Samaria. This is significant because Jesus was a Jew, and the Samaritans and the Jews did not get along. So it's kind of like enemy territory, you know? So, well, Jesus stops at a well in Samaria to rest his feet and to get a sip of water. And while he's there, he meets a Samaritan woman. And as he talks with her, he speaks to her, as Jesus so often does, about matters of salvation, about receiving the gift of eternal life with God. And as they talk, it becomes pretty clear that this woman doesn't really know what to make of Jesus. And at one point, after Jesus pries into her personal matters, She tries to shift the focus of the conversation, and she shifts it to, of all things, worship. She says to Jesus, our fathers, the Samaritans, that is, worshiped on this mountain, the mountain that they were on. She says, but you Jews claim that the place we must worship is in Jerusalem. So what is she talking about here? Well, in a nutshell, her statement is a reference to temple worship. You may recall that the Jews went to the temple to worship God because they believed that's where the presence of God dwelt. He was at the temple, so if you wanted to see Him, if you wanted to worship Him, that's where you would go. It makes sense, right? If you're a Jew. But what if you're a Samaritan? The Samaritans, who were a mix of Jewish and Gentile ancestry, had their own version of Jewish life. 
And included in their version of, of Jewish life was their very own temple. This is what the woman makes reference to, that the Jews and the Samaritans had two different places where they worshiped God. And Jesus' response to her is what I want us to look at today. He says this, starting in verse 21. Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Now this already is a bold statement on Jesus' end. He detaches the worship of God from a particular location. Now why this may not sound too out there for you, it would have been really crazy for someone in Jesus' day to say this. I mean, God is in the temple. How are you going to worship Him if you don't go to the temple? He goes on to explain in verse 23. He says, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and His worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. What a fascinating statement this is. You know, the journalist in me immediately recognizes this for the front page story that it is. What Jesus is talking about here is that His people can worship God wherever they are because God's Spirit resides within them. Because we have this Spirit connection, we can worship God in spirit and in truth. So what do we do with this passage? What are some takeaways for us here? I think there are a couple of big ones. The biggest one being that we want to be the kind of worshipers who make God happy. Jesus says that true worshipers worship in spirit and in truth. For us to worship in spirit and in truth, we need a few things. We need, first off, a true understanding of who God is. And unless this is your first time to ever be involved in a church service, you probably know where we get a true picture of God. It's in the Bible, of course. If you want a true picture of who God is, then you should absolutely turn to the Scriptures, because in the Scriptures, He tells us about Himself. And when we get this true picture of God in all of His power and might and love and mercy, then we will be inspired to respond to Him, to react to Him in with our worship. We also need, in addition to, the, to true, a true picture of who He is, we also need the Spirit. When we become Christians, that is when we receive forgiveness for our sins through the shed blood of Jesus, and when we commit our lives to Him, when this happens, God gives us the gift of His Spirit. And the Spirit of God in us inspires us to seek out God and to live for Him. The Spirit within us inspires us to worship with everything that we've got. We need Spirit and we need truth. Finally, this passage is a reminder to us that we don't have to go to a particular location to worship God. For us, this means that we don't have to go to our church building to worship. Our building is nice, but it's not God's residence. He is everywhere. And He is especially present in the lives of His people. As God's people, we are far holier than any building. In other words, if you are a Christ follower, know that God is always with you. This means that as you go about your business, as you live life at work or school or home or on vacation or at the church building or at the park, wherever you are, You are constantly being given the opportunity to both encounter the living God and to respond to Him with your worship. So church, let's strive to live each day as a response to the goodness of our loving God, which He has shown to us most clearly in Christ Jesus our Lord. Will you pray with me? Kind Father, You have blessed us richly in Christ Jesus. In Him, You have created us, You have redeemed us, and You have given us purpose. Help us, Father, to live each day as a response to the cross. Reveal Yourself to us this week in a new way. Give us a deeper appreciation and understanding of You. Help us to stop this week and just be in awe of You. 
We love you so very much, and we thank you for Jesus. Amen. Church family, have a happy Father's Day. We'll be seeing you soon. And until then, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. Have a great week.